agent. This was 1958, and the, the summers, a group of friends of mine and I would go out to Fire Island and rent a house. There was a guy that real character there named Charlie Casher, who um, was a carnival walker at one time, and when he was in Baltimore in 1951, he, um, him and his brother would said, let's do some television spots. We can sell a lot of stuff on television. So they came up with this product that they didn't really have yet called Charles Antel, born, formula number nine hair tie. <laughs> and in 1958, Charles Repson bought their company for $15 million. A Revlon. A Revlon, yeah, which was like $75 million today. You know, they were, so he used to have big bodies, you know, he, he was like Gatsby's, and her back rep used to be there. And he used to love us because we were young 22 year old kids and we had all of the young girls and following us. We used to go there, and Mel used to go there. And at that time, he was divorced. And, uh, and he had three kids. And, and he, he must have been about 32, 33 years old. And he'd see me, and I'd see him, but I never talked to him. And, and cut to um, 19, um, 1972, 70, 1973, I'm now a very successful, I, I was a very successful agent in a company called Creative Management Associates, and I represented Larry Wood and Alvin Finney and Robert Redford and a lot, you know, Peter Sellers, a lot of very big people. But while I was an agent, left to become a producer Two of my clients, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda, the Easy Rider, and I was involved in the whole process. And this, I was really in the mix. And there was this agent that used to work for me at the company, and he started to become a real big agent. And he called and said, Why don't you come back to be an agent, be a partner with me? And I said, No, I don't want to do that anymore. But do you have any projects? And he said, yeah, Gene Wilder wrote something. And Gene wasn't a star then in 73. And uh, I said, let me read something. He said, well, he has an eight-page outline of a project called Young Frankenstein. And I represent some actors that would be right for it. Peter Boyle, Gene Wilder, and Marty Feldman. And I said, really? You know, they weren't stars like He said, there's just one problem. If you like it, um, I'm going to have to, and you want to do it, I'll recommend you to Mel, but he may have a producer in New York that he's worked with. He had done two other movies. And Mel couldn't stop, restart his career after making those two movies. As good as they were, they didn't make any money. So the 12 chairs end up. And the producers, yes. So they didn't make any money. And, and he had a, he, for three years, he um, was hustling and not getting anything done. And uh, Gene says, well, Mel, he, you don't know him. I said, no, I, I know of him. I used to be around him, but we never met. So he says, OK, he'll meet you at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. So I go to the Beverly Hills Hotel. I knock on the door of the room that he was at. He opens the door, looks at me up and down, and slams the door in my face. <laughs> he opens the door immediately and says, you're Michael Groskopf, you pisser you. What are you doing here? Where are your friends? Where are your bathing suits? <laughs> we have a big pool outside. And he says, come on in. And after three to five minutes of just talking, I want you to produce this picture. Just get me a deal. Got a deal. As soon as the script was finished, uh, I made a deal with Columbia, and the uh, budget uh, of the movie was a little too high. And because Mel and and they wanted us to cut about two hundred thousand dollars out of the budget, we were going to make it for two million. And Mel uh, said, "I don't know if we can do it." And, and he um, 
He said, well, we'll manage, we'll manage. And they said, okay, do the best you can. As we were working out, Mel says, and we want to make it in black and white. And they said, are you kidding? <laughs> no, we don't want to do it in black and white. And Mel keeps on saying there were like a whole bunch of, you know, thundering Jews, thundering Jews chasing us, chasing us down the hall. <laughs> you can't do it in black and white. <laughs> so he said, what are we going to do? And I said, listen, a good friend of mine just took out, to, went to 20th Century Fox. And I'll slip the script to them tonight. And I slipped it to my friend Alan Lyon Jr. He read it, he loved it, he gave it to the man that he was working with then, Gordon Stelberg. He read it. And the next day we had lunch with them at the Beverly Hill Crest Hotel on Pico Boulevard. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, he said, let's make the movie. And not only that, we got $2,200,000 to make the movie. And that was it, you know, so. So you know, all this yeah. craziness going on yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. When you guys actually got into production, I mean, this is a really funny movie. So while you were making the film, you guys had to be, you know, is there one specific scene or moment during the production that was just like. Yes, yes. Laughter. The arrival of Madeline Kahn to the castle. You remember with that little mink stole that she had? And whenever, whenever Marty would open his mouth, we couldn't stop laughing. And Mel knew this. So he had somebody buy like 120 handkerchiefs. And he says, I know what's going to happen, and I don't want to lose any time because time is money, you know, when you're making a movie. And you have 60 people, you know, around you. Put the handkerchiefs in your mouth when you know, when you your mouth alive. But still, when, when people were coughing up the handkerchiefs. Because Marty would keep on going back. And then he started going to the head of the man. So we had to get an extra, we, we knew we got an extra mink there, you know, from Madeline. And Madeline kept on banging him over the head. And what, what happened, we had, all had to leave the set, including myself. I made an example of everybody leaving the set. And I said, well, I'm going. And we, you know, we got the scene, and we were on time. But that was the funniest scene. And the monster is in. So, because when you go on IMDb, type in Young Frankenstein, it gives you a bunch of tri a trivia on the film. Mm -hmm. So there was a piece of trivia that said that, and, you know, this is not verifiable, so we'll verify it with you. Is it true? that the monster found a wife on the set of the film. Yeah, that, that actually happened. Um, do you know that, what, what was her name again? Um, uh, <coughs> Lorraine Boyle. L well, it was Lorraine something else. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine Alderman. L Lorraine Alderman came on the set for Rolling Stone to do a big story on the making of, of the movie. And she interviewed me and everybody else there and, and there was Peter on getting his makeup on. And she said, you mind if I go over and, and interview him? I said, let me ask him. And he said, yeah, is she cute? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, yes, yeah, she's cute. <laughs> well, they wound up getting married. <laughs> they had two kids. You know, she looks after his estate now. And uh, they had very good life together. You know. She writes something in the book about it, about the relationship. Very, uh, it's, a very, it's a very interesting history with, with the film because the film itself lends from the James Well classics of the 30s. And a lot of people don't know this, but the set, the laboratory, was actually, you know, you were there. You know? Yeah, well, the lab, we, we didn't realize that they, they had some of the stuff that was in the, the real stuff that was in the movie. So we were going and talking to people about getting fake stuff and how do we make it look real. And then the, my production manager came to me one day and he says, the guy, uh, Strip Patton, who did it, he's alive. <laughs> and he's living in Santa Monica. And he has the set in his garage. <laughs> Would you? Mel, Mel said, when can we see it? He said, anytime. We got in our car. <laughs> and we went out to Santa, we went to Santa Monica. 
job, real job good. And uh, talked to him for a while, and he said, do you want tea and all that? And we, he opened up the garage, and there was the set. And I was with Gene and Mel at the time, and they were like looking at the Holy Grail. They said, we got this. We got it. He says, if they came to me and said, make the deal, and we'll pay them anything they want. Make the deal. So I went up to Kenneth Street Biden and said, how do we get it? Do it? And first, can we do pay you? And he said, yeah, just give me $1,200 a week, and, and you have it. And I said, well, if, but you'll have, we'll give you 2500 a week, but we'd like you there. And he said, really, uh, I'd love to, you know. So he came with the, the old deal. We got the set, we got Kenneth, who was a doll. And it was, it was great. But the reaction to Mel and Gene, who are real Frankenstein fans, and seeing the real stuff, was amazing. And so authentic, yeah. And all these years later, 2015, this comes in your mind. You and Mel actually conceived the book, so I... Yeah, I was... Um, some people I know do documentaries and like some of the movies I made. So, but one, you know, you have grandkids and all, and, and I did them a number of favors over the years. And they said, we'd like to do you a favor and we'll do a little documentary and you can talk about the movies that you've done. And uh, it'll be a half hour for the family. And I said, great. He said, but you need to do one thing because it's important with you know selling you know documentaries and books and all. Um, get um, take photographs of you on the set with the stars and the directors and whatever you can that you know show. It's really important for the kids and all. I worked with Kurt Eastwood and a lot of people that would help. And I said, well, the first place I'll go to, looking for the photographs, with 20th Century Fox, I made five movies there. And uh, there were two of these wonderful women that were running the archive of Fox. And I called them before, they said, oh, please come. And if we, yeah, we know your movies, and please come, come there. I was on the lot for like 12 years, so, you know, before they even started working there, but, but they knew of the films. And uh, I said, hi, they said, where do you want to start? I said, I'll start with young Frankenstein. How many photos do you have there? Thinking that they may have 800, 1,200. They said, we have 9,240 photos. <laughs> I said, you're going to make me work that hard? <laughs> I started going. They said, we can set you up with slides and everything. And it'll be easy for you. And uh, I said, okay, I'll come here and like over lunch twice a week if you promise to have lunch with me. And they said, yes. So I started going for about four or five weeks, about 10 times, after seeing 10 times, I went through about 2,500. And I said, I'll pick 200 and show it to Mel. And if he thinks it's in the ballpark, then I'll come back and get more, you know. So I went over to his office, you know, I, I said, this is the plan. He says, okay, if it's great, and they have good stuff, let's, let's go ahead with it. So he looked at it, and after looking at 10 pictures, he said, yeah, let, let's, let's get about 200 ones that we like. And um, I went back, and I, I still think I left over with maybe 3,000. I haven't seen <laughs> Young Frankenstein 2 book, you know. So, you know, he said, let's do it. And we have a mutual friend who's a uh, top book, book agent in London. And he said, good, I'm glad you called me. I'm going to the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair next week. They have a big book fair in Frankfurt, Germany, every year in, in October. And, um, he calls us and says, I made a deal for you guys. You know, and it will be a Hachette Publishing, it's a big international company. And then we, you know, started working on the book. And this gentleman 
on my right helped a lot in getting the book done. <laughs> <laughs>